Lord's sons, Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Right, brother, thank you, brother. God bless you. All right, thank you guys. Oh, wow. This is not my forte. I'm not a speaker. Um, but it's funny how God takes what you're not strong at, what you're weak at, and uses it. Because for me, growing up, my name's Emilio Mendoza. Let me start with that. Um, I am 53. I have one brother, four years apart. He's younger. And I grew up in L.A. by Dodger Stadium. A um, lot going on with that right now. Um, and so, growing up in L.A., uh, there was a lot of challenges. Grew up in a gang-infested neighborhood. Uh, I have a, a mother who worked two jobs, who was hardly ever home. And so my brother and I had to raise ourselves. So, you know, it was hard. It was hard to uh, be a young man, and we didn't have a father. Our father left when we, we were around, I was around five, he left. And so growing up without a father figure is not easy. And I, I don't know if you guys have both your parents, but if you do, go home and hug them, because it's a blessing. Um, marriage is a blessing. Um, you know, we need both our parents. But sometimes we have good people around us. You know, my grandmother, my aunts. And I remember the only church that I had at that time was my grandmother had her saints in the corner and she was always praying. And she only spoke Spanish. And you know, we didn't speak Spanish. We didn't get raised speaking Spanish. So she always says, ay sordo, you know? And I could never understand what she was saying other than I'm sordo. And so I could never have that uh, conversation with my grandma on her faith. She kind of kept it to herself. But I know that she was praying for us because at a young age, um, we, went to, uh, we were confirmed. My brother and I, my cousins, we all went to the catechism. We were confirmed. So I'm, I, f I felt like that was the beginning of the blessing of having the Holy Spirit. Because I know throughout my life, I went through so many things that I shouldn't be here. Now that I look back, I'm like, I should have been dead. I don't know why I'm here. And we hear a lot of these testimonies, and, and you have to look back at your life and say, wow, you know, how did that happen? So no father around. Um, had a stepfather who came into the picture, was an alcoholic and a womanizer. We would see him in the park with other women, and my mother would be crushed. And here we are, these young boys, watching our mother being devastated, and she wouldn't leave him. So we, I would say, I'm never going to be like that. I'm never going to be that man. But lo and behold, you get older, and you start to mimic the things around you. And I became that man. I became a womanizer. Um, our neighborhood, you know, we had our, our homies. So we would hang out, and uh, what we're doing? Well, we're, we're drinking. We're drinking all the time. Not just drinking, but doing drugs as well. So, you know, growing up in my teens, there was always drinking, drugs, girls. And that seemed to be the goal at that time. That was like, cool. I'm having a good time. I'm partying. Um, as I got old enough to get a job and move out, started partying more. Uh, there was always partying going on. That seemed to be the thing. And not ever really having a good relationship with a woman, not knowing how to have a relationship with a woman. It's always playing a game, always thinking you're getting ahead. You're always um, winning some, something. And over time, um, it made it hard for me to have relationships. I just couldn't have good relationships because there was always drinking involved. There's always drugs involved. There's always lying. There's no virtues. There's nothing grounded in virtues. And the only person in my life at that time was my Aunt Lucy, who passed, God rest her soul, in the 90s. But she was the light. She was the one, mijo, you know, good job, good drawing. She'd take me to school. She was being my mom when my mom couldn't be my mom. My mom was always working and always sleeping. And so, you know, let me fast forward a little bit. So I get older. Um, I got a great job. Everything's good. Got nice cars, and I finally buy a home. 
I bought a beautiful home. And like, oh, I've got the life. This is it. I made it. But that's not everything. So I had the big house, pool, jacuzzi, cars, trailers, all that stuff. It's OK, now it's time to find a wife, get settled down. Oh, I skipped a little bit. In high school, at 17, I had a daughter. And at 17, being a, a, a boy, not knowing what to do, I was just like, oh no, not mine. You know, that was my attitude. And not wanting to be a part of that at an early age. But within that year, I, I, the reality of it was like, okay, she just wanted me to be there for my daughter. And I, I did. I started being a weekend dad. But I was always drinking. So my daughter would always see her dad always partying. She'd come over to the house on the weekends. Dad's outside with the guys. We're all partying. Music's loud. That's the dad she knew. So fast forward, I'm older now. I'm in my 30s. I'm 35. I'm like, I got to find my, I got to find a wife. Got the house. Got everything's good. Job. Find a wife. Find a wife in the clubs. Because that's all, you know, when you're young, I was just always in the clubs. Found a wife. Thought, thought life was good. I'm ready to settle down and, and uh, maybe, uh, you know, her kids, she had two, two kids, a boy and a girl. I had my daughter. And she was already in high school. And I was like, okay, you know, this is it, man. We're just going to travel, have a good time. Well, she wanted to have a kid. And at that point in my life, I was like, ah, eh, we kind of have our kids. They're young already. They're almost out of school. I want to enjoy life. But slowly, the idea of having a family with a mother and father, because I didn't have that, started to make sense. Like, oh, well, I'm married now. Maybe this is a, this is a good thing. Why am I uh, fighting it? So she had her tubes already tied. So she had to untie them, which cost a lot of money, to have this child. And so we tried. And we had a miscarriage. And that was the beginning of the end, because we weren't grounded in a faith. We were going to church. We weren't, or at least for me, I was just going through the motions. I was sitting there. I wasn't hearing anything. So that's why, you know, when they say the sower, the seed, you know, it's got to be on. It, I was on rocky ground. I was just going. I was just making an appearance thinking, okay, as soon as we get out of here, I'm going to grab a beer. I'm going to be barbecuing. I'm going to put the music on. That was always my thought. Can't wait to get home. And so I wasn't following. I wasn't listening. You know, those who don't listen, they don't hear. And so... But the Lord was planting seeds then, even now that I look back. Because once that relationship ended in divorce, and, you know, that's a whole other story I can go into with our kids and my parents and my mom, my brother. You know, my relationships with everybody just got strained. I was hating on the world. I was hating on my life. I was like, why did, why did this happen to me? You know, I, I did everything right. So I thought. And so I finally lost the house, and I went into party mode. I said, you know what? I'm going back to my old ways. My church was the bar for five years. Me and my boys were just hanging at the bar. Best ever. Oh, man. Just being there, being with like-minded people. It was my church. It felt like the place to be. And I was you know, doing those things I was doing when I was younger. And it just, it got old. After a while, you start to realize when you're hurting other people and you're hurting yourself, you start to lose a little bit of your soul every time you do that, when you give yourself away. And so there was one night I got in my car. I was probably drinking around the clock. I can't even remember. I was drinking wild turkey. I, don't, I can't even remember, to be honest with you. But I got in my car, I drove, I hit a fence, and I ended up in jail. And I'm like, how did I get here? I remember sitting in this cold cell, and I'm hung over bad, just really bad headache, and thinking, this is not me. How did I get in this cell? I got a great job, got good people around me, but all the people around me were gone. And I pushed them away. It wasn't. It was me being distant because I didn't know how to be a man, for one, because I wasn't brought up with a father who taught me right from wrong. I was learning on the streets. So that was the beginning of my Lord saying, all right, stop. You're going too fast. I could have killed somebody. 
I could have killed somebody, I could have killed myself, I don't remember. And that's a bad place to be when you don't know how you ended up where you're at and how your car ended up where it ended up. So thank God for my brother and sister, Patty and Noel, who were heading uh, this new sower in Santa Clarita. And even before that, there was a, a sower in Azusa that I, they would invite me to back in the day where I would go as a friend, but I wasn't really, you know, I was hearing the testimony, but you know, it was the music that was getting me more than anything. So, you know, now they got one in Santa Clarita, they're inviting me, I'm going, I'm sitting there very prideful, listening to testimonies, I'm like, and at this point, I don't think I've ever really cried. You know, you got that pride, that toughness. I would listen to people's testimonies like, man, they're like me, but worse. You know, they're going through stuff that, wow. And I'm like, okay. I started to realize we're all broken. We're all the same. We're all going through something. And it doesn't matter how big or small, but it's the same pain. And so I was just like, okay, I can't go to the bars anymore. I, I, I don't have those friends anymore. I got this DUI and I got a breathalyzer in my car. I can just get to work and back. I'm holding on to my job. I don't even know how I hold on to my job for so long. And so here I am hanging on, just like, all right. And then there's the one time I just, I was carrying all this pain and hate. I was angry at my mom because I think she, I felt in my heart that she was happy that, you know, my marriage failed because, you know, at that time she was getting along with my wife. I was angry at my daughter. She went back to, with her mom. My brother wasn't talking to me because he thought I kicked my mom out. So all of these layers of just hate, and I was hating on everybody. And I was by myself, and here I am sleeping on my mom's sofa, being angry. I remember just not wanting to come home, putting my music on, and just not talking to her. I was ugly. I was an ugly person at that time. But I could hear her praying in the room. I'm like, who's she talking to? And she was praying for me. And not only her, but all those brothers and a sower were praying for me. And I was like, and at some point I, I had to get up. I was, I, the rocks that I was carrying, this bag of pain, shame, hurt, resentment, I couldn't move anymore. And I had to go to the altar. And the, the, the day that I went up there, I never cried like this in my life. It just came out like a flood. Everything came out. And I asked the Lord to take it from me, and he took it from me. And not only did he take it from me, I stopped drinking. And that was, and that's all you know all your life is like, I can't wait to get out of work. You go to get an 18-pack, and then you keep doing it all day. That's all you know. That's all I knew. And for it to be gone, that's, that's the grace of God. It has nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with me. Amen. All glory and praise to him. And so that was the beginning of a transformation. Um, that was one time. Am I good on time? Okay. And then so there was another time where we went to a Jesse Romero retreat. And it was a hot little church, man. We're baking in there. <laughs> and he's talking about the evils of the world. He's talking about Hollywood. He's talking about government. He's talking about all these things. And I'm thinking, man, I know the evils of the world. Me and my brother have seen evil within the drugs that we were doing, the people that were hanging around. We witness evil. We know that there's a, an enemy. We know that there's a devil. And I started to feel this, this overwhelming desire to get closer to God. And I remember my sister said, you know, there, there's a priest here, they're doing confessions in the back. And I'm thinking, confession? What's, the last, what's that? I don't even remember. I was probably a kid. But I said, yes, I want to do it. I want to go. Went back there, gave my confession. And that was kind of like the beginning. Because I remember I bought Jesse Romero's book. I couldn't wait to share it with my brother because he would relate with it. And I went to have him sign it. I remember fairly feeling his power. Like, like I felt like I was on acid. Like his, his presence of a holy man. And here I am, an, an evil, wicked man. And I felt this ne pins and needles. Like the enemy was fighting it. And so I bought that book, and that was one, um, that's one time, that, you know, I, I, we call it test, uh, uh, a, test, um, a mentanoia, is when you're having a transformation. There was a few of those for me. It was a few little uh, tidbits. There was a, a retreat that we went to, I got invited to, I was helping serve, I didn't really want to be there. But I remember the guy up there speaking was talking about his, his wife and him had, were trying to have a baby, and they had lost so many times, they were having miscarriages, and so many times. 
And I'm always a hot one in the room. And it could be room temperature and I'm sweating. And I'm in the back. I'm in the back of the, the by the door observing. Listen to this. And I'm cold. I'm like, Phew. And, and he talks about how they, they, had this, they had a baby. They finally had a baby. And I feel this little hand touch me, behind me. And it's his wife with their newborn baby. And the baby's warm as heck. Like, I'm like cold. And the baby's hot. And so that was another God incident where I felt the Lord's presence, where I couldn't put my hand around it. Like, what's going on here? You know, I'm, I'm, something's happening. And I can't, I can't put my finger on it. But then the, 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 the Holy Sacrament came out and everyone's on their knees and I'm like, I got to get down there too. And so, man, the Lord is, is good because he's calling me and I'm finally saying yes. I don't know what I'm saying yes to, but I'm, I'm, I'm like, I, I have nothing else. And so, you know, as a kid, I was always running and biking and I always had headphones set. I, I, music was my, my, my go-to. It was my savior. I, 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 it was my escape. All the sad songs, all the, the hurt. But there was never a, an ending, to, a, a happy ending to the songs I was listening to. And I was at Sower Azusa and Paul Harrigan's band. And if you look them up, you'll see the, the, the first band uh, in Azusa. And I remember he sang this song called Ready Now. And I was like, oh, I want to do that. He's rocking it, though. He's playing it in a way that's like speaking to me, all the stuff I'm listening to. And so, you know, so were um, classes come up in a, a Santa Cruz, and I, I do them. And right away, they're like, come sing with us, guy. You know, you, we know you can sing. Come up. And so I go up there, and now I'm in the band and going to retreats. And when you go to retreats, the spirit is powerful. You come out with an a grace that you just can't explain. People at work are telling me, what's wrong with you? Are you high? Because I would go to work so filled with the spirit after a sower night. I'll be like, hey, how you doing, brother? Hey, And they're like, are you on crack? I'm like, I didn't know that I had that in me early on. And then they started coming to me and asking me or giving me their problems. Like, hey, you know, not really knowing that they knew me that way. But the spirit was in me and the Lord was using me at that time that I didn't understand yet. And I started seeing that and I said, okay, Lord. I even wrote a song, I said, oh, Lord, why me after all I've done? Who am I to lead? I'm the most broken. Who am I to sing? I could barely read, but now I'm down on my knees, praising, help me, Jesus. So, you know, everyone here has a gift. You're not here on purpose. It's not a coincidence. The, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. If Jesus can pick 12 people and change the world, and this is a good world when, when you know your history and you know where we've come from as Christians, as Catholics, yeah, we're seeing some dark times, but that's nothing new. We've seen dark times all throughout the ages. This is our time. This is our time to step up, to take whatever gift you have, take it in fear, put it out there. And I'm going to use that for the grace of God and, and all his glory and all my community and, and, and our, our, our family unit. All these things that they're trying to take away from us, they can't take it. It's ours. And the Lord gave it to us. We just have to be the hands and feet. So guys, I'm grateful to be here.